to explain the, the state of the art, what most companies do today is, um, so you have your game running on your local PC, console, mobile phone, whatever. And then you have other players which send you input and game state. And of course you have latency, right? So everything you get from the other players takes, if you are lucky, 20 milliseconds. If you are not so lucky, maybe 200 milliseconds. And if they, you are really not lucky at all, it may be 500 milliseconds or something. So then usually you have one authoritative server uh, in a good location who is correcting and who is a boss and he decides basically, okay, who, who hit whom and um, who is winning or was it a headshot or not or whatnot. Um, again, this boss is attached to you with a latency as well. So now game developers or your, your net coders or the guy, your developers who are doing the net code have to figure all this out. So they have to program this game to make sense with delayed information and to predict stuff and to correct the physics and everything. So it's super complicated. So and what we found in the past 10 years, there are lots of successful uh, games and studios building multiplayer, but all teams struggle with the latency, with jitter, uh, with the lag, so people do something and it's kind of, it doesn't feel, it feels delayed. So with cheating, if your game gets successful, suddenly there are a lot of cheaters trying to find ways to, to use aimbots, to, to um, crash your servers, right? So there's a huge motivation of uh, people out there of your community just to, to ruin the experience of other players, right? You would say this, this doesn't make sense, but that's, uh, so we see more and more DDoS attacks recently, so this is a, a topic you have to deal with. And of course bandwidth, even though uh, 5G and internet and everything is getting better, nevertheless, if, if you do not pay attention and you send too much, this will lead to disconnects. Disconnects, again, you have to handle it in your game, let's say if you want that people can reconnect after disconnect, all this is a big mess, right? So our claim is we make multiplayer simple, but I have to admit it's not really simple. So, and there's a new thing happening which I think is really interesting. And it's taking a very different approach which may sound a little bit magic, and it is a little bit magic. Um, so, Let's assume you would build a game. So your game without the rendering, just the pure game, I call it simulation. And you have one controller attached to it, which is your local controller, right? So it can be your mouse, your keyboard, of course it could be a controller. And the other players are connected like it would be local to your game. So you as a developer, you do not see network at all. It looks like there are four controllers attached to your local simulation. So, and this is how you build your game. So, there's only input. Input is right, left, up, down, jump, shoot. Can be a swipe. In, in VR, it could be like moving your hand control, all right? So, all this is input. But it's nothing, so input is coming from outside into your game. So it's not something that's happening, it's not game state or characters moving or bullets or what's on, what not. So, and the beauty is your code, your writing is working single player, it's working local multiplayer, it's working online and it's, it's exactly the same code. Because again, it looks like all the controllers are attached to that simulation. So another big advantage is um, that your physics engine, so let's say you, you are building a soccer game and you have a ball which is shared across all clients, it, it's, it's only there once. You, you do not have a distributed, oh, I get somebody hit the ball, a different player, and, and now, but in my local simulation, it's totally different. This doesn't exist. You just have one physics system 
and just by default it will be networked. Another big topic is bots. So let's say some player would get disconnected, so you would want the bot to jump in for him, right? So he would be driving through a tunnel or lose his internet connection. You could, a, a bot could take over, this guy is reconnecting after 20 seconds and the bot is disappearing. So all this is very natural in this model. So uh, the feedback from developers, so first of it sounds too good to be true, right? So what's, what's the catch? So what's, why, why is this, why has never uh, somebody done uh, something like this? Um, uh, I, I don't know. Um, so to get the big picture, though, that simulation that I showed, the same simulation is running on every client. It can be 30 clients, it can be 10, it can be one. There's one limitation, so you, because you have to send input to every client, there is a natural limit of how many people can play in the same game. So this technique would never work for an MMO where you have hundreds or thousands of players. Um, there's another important thing. So let's say you are playing with 30 people in an I.O. game, for example, and you're um, and one guy has a horrible connection, so he has whatever, 500 milliseconds or even two seconds of um, input he's sending very, very late. So all the other clients would suffer. So there's one trick, uh, because everything is running through a relay, so the relay is basically deciding if information is coming too late. So the, the relay can, uh, can invalidate stuff and punish the guy with a bad latency and reset him basically. So right. So I, let's say I would be the guy with a bad latency. So I would move my character and it would move up and the, uh, and the server would invalidate me all the time. So on my screen it would look like I go up, it, I would be resetted to my position. I go up and it would be resetted to my position. On all the other clients it would look like I, I'm, I'm standing still. And that's a big problem in multiplayer games if you don't use a technique like this to deal with clients which have a bad latency because, because they have the potential to ruin the complete experience. Um, so you want to have a very, very fast protocol, UDP based usually, you are sending around input, so you, ne you need to send stuff reliable because you want it to arrive. All the input needs to arrive, um, uh, but it can be out of order. So um, I use the term uh, deterministic game engine. So there, um, usually, let's say most network solutions you you get out there, or if you would build your own, are more a transport layer. So they give you a way to connect different clients with um, with a fast UDP connection, and you can send packages around. Right. So that's what I call a transport layer. Um, so Steam networking, for example, if you use Steam networking, they give you a very fast way to, to send packages back and forth. Um, so usually, um, this whole gameplay simulation and the rendering, this is typically, let's say, what a game engine would take over. Um, so now, in this deterministic game engine, you need to make sure that the complete game logic is deterministic because you, are, you only have input and you, you need to make sure that um, no matter what device, be it a mobile phone, be it a PC, be it a console, it needs to generate the same game state. And that's, let's say, the challenge or why it was so hard to develop a solution like that because this block needs to be deterministic. And because of float, let's say every physics engine um, is usually using, uh, you are, not usually, is using floating point numbers. So, and floating point numbers, 
will generate different results on different platforms. Different results means on one platform you could, you could collide, on the other one not, and suddenly, boom, you are out of sync. And with the same input you would generate on a, on a phone and on a PC, you could have totally different results. So, um, so in our case, so we built this deterministic game engine and we built the complete simulation uh, decoupled from the view and it provides like the complete stack from uh, entity component system, uh, fixed point math library, animation control, physics engine, pathfinding, and everything is fitting together. So you have the input layer here, so the simulation only gets input from controllers. Network is completely abstracted away and you do not see it at all. And the view is clearly decoupled, is pulling the game state from the simulation and then nicely rendering everything. So one thing, it needs to be super fast and, and uh, to explain that really quickly, so let's say your, games run, your game run at 30 hertz, it, it means that per tick you only have 33 milliseconds. Basically one second divided by 30, that's 33 milliseconds. So in 33 milliseconds you have to do everything. You have to calculate all the uh, game logic, the physics, the pathfinding, and you have to render everything on the screen. So let's say if you say I take 25% of my time budget, 8 milliseconds, and do the simulation, um, it's not only you have to run the simulation once, but you have to cope with all the rollbacks you are doing constantly. So you only have half a millisecond, so 500 uh, microseconds, to basically do all the calculation. And you need to use really special techniques like uh, data-oriented architecture, no garbage collection, IL2CPP and Unity and so on, and then you get really down to um, simulation times which are significantly below a millisecond. So why does it disrupt um, multiplayer game development? Um, so you have, you get a completely deterministic system. Uh, zero lag means everything you do happens instantly. It's eSport grade. Um, you can do replay, spectating, you can just replay the input, you have a perfect replay, you have cheat protection because you cannot uh, teleport uh, players anymore, you can only um, send around input, so you cannot uh, teleport uh, clients or send game state around. There's no net code, you just deal with input. It's low bandwidth because you're only sending the input and it's um, super fast. So the advantages are overwhelming, but again, it doesn't fit for every uh, use case out there, but it fits for a lot of use cases. So we build this thing as kind of a reference implementation if you want. So we worked on it for three years. We launched it about two years ago. Um, we've won some of the most amazing teams to use it. But we are super happy to work with independent teams and to work something out. So we want to get this to passionate, dedicated teams. So we are not looking, let's say, for hobbyists or people who cannot afford to go even on a conference or who are not really dedicated to this. But if you have great ideas, we are super happy to, to onboard you. Um, so, not sure if you have some... Perfect time. We have about a minute left. I mean, I'm a huge fan of this because I think the demo you showed me, uh, it must have been six months ago or something, of a small game. But because the deterministic physics, when there was an explosion happening, the explosion moved the vehicles in the same direction on every screen playing. Which, if you know anything about trying to make physics work on games, that's really difficult. And it wasn't complicated to do, and it just worked. So anyway, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan, but I'm biased. Uh, anyone got a quick question for Christoph? So you've either wowed them or I've scared them off. <laughs> I, I'm much. here to, if you have questions anytime. Uh, a genuinely really fascinating thing and it's, uh, it's very accessible to anybody. But I think what's interesting is making sure you think about it first before you get started rather than going down the, right, the road and trying to reinvent it, you know, trying to reconvert your game afterwards might be a bit more complicated.